And in both of them, I noticed there was mention of a little actress called Ellen Nelly. Dickens always called her Nelly. Nelly Turnham, uh, who had been close to him during the last 12 and a half years of his life. And I thought, um, when I read uh, Wilson and Johnson saying she was spoilt, proud, and mercenary, boring, uh, failed Dickens's need. She was altogether written off as a bad thing. I thought, well, but what else have they told us about her? What do we know about her? There's a story there. And then I finished at Cambridge, and I went to London, and I got married, and I worked, and I got jobs. And fast forward, fast forward to the 1980s, when I was working at the Sunday Times, and into a message came from the editor, Andrew Neal, who said a man had come into his office with a story about an illegitimate, child, an illegitimate child of Charles Dickens, and would I look into it? Because it seemed very well attested. He had a lot of newspaper cuttings about it. It was quite clear that it, this came from, it had, from Australia and then from India. And I dimly remembered something about this. At that time, Sunday Times was in the Gray's Inn Road. I went over to Doughty Street, where the Charles Dickens Museum is, and went in and asked and asked, spoke to the curator there, David Parker. He was then a wonderful curator who gradually became looked more and more like Dickens as the years <laughs> went by. <laughs> um, and David Parker told me the story of Charlie Peters, who had in 1900 changed his name to Hector Charles Bulwer Lytton Dickens <laughs> in Australia, claimed to be the illegitimate son, first of Dickens and his sister-in-law, and then when he realised the sister-in-law was still alive, he changed it wisely to saying it was one of the maids at Gat Hill he was the child of. He had a family of his own, he went to India, he claimed a scholarship, he had convinced all the Indians that he was the child of Dickens. Um, later on, he would even apparently, or his son, would come to England and lay flowers on Dickens's grave in Westminster Abbey. And this story kept coming up and kept being denied and kept coming up again. People love stories like that. All biographers know this. Famous men have countless illegitimate children who <laughs> creep out of the woodwork. Um, well, when David Parker and I had, had a good laugh about this, I said, I've sometimes thought I'd like to write about Nellie Turnham. And he said, I can't tell you how many people I've warned off doing that. And then he paused and looked at me. I had published a book about Mary Wollstonecraft and a short book about Shelley. And he looked at me and he looked at me and he said, but I think you might be the person to do it. And he then said he would give me every bit of help um, he could. And uh, indeed, he introduced me to a Miss Longley who had been working, researching Lily Turner's life. Uh, an admirable woman, but she was absolutely motivated by the wish to prove that the relationship had been an innocent one. She thought mm -hmm. Nellie Turnham had been an elocution teacher <laughs> of Dickens, and that when they had secret meetings, it was actually so that he could recite. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, I decided. Uh, I decided I would do this, and I think I was about. I was about to leave the Sunday Times because of whopping and all that. Uh, and I had a great friend in Cambridge, Graham Storey, now dead, uh, who had taught my first husband at Trinity Hall and who was, of course, now an editor of the Clarendon edition of the Dickens Letters. And Graham was incredibly kind to me. And most of those volumes of Dickens Letters were not yet published. And he let me come and look at all the, look at the archive, look at all the unpublished letters, which was a huge help uh, to me. And as soon as I got down to work, and there was a lot of research to be done, because Catherine Longley let me see what she'd done, but she wouldn't sort of guide me in any way. And I said to her, I don't know what I think. I'm agnostic about what the relationship was, so I'm going in with an open mind. And she was, she was a very striking and interesting woman. And um, I didn't want to upset her, but I felt I had to make that plain to her. T Nellie Turlan, as soon as I saw her, I thought this is the most, this is the most extraordinary discovery to have made. Um, she and her two elder sisters, Fanny and Maria, were so entirely different from the Victorian stereotype of women born in the 1830s. Uh, they were completely different from any of Dickens's fictional dolls. I think we have to call them dolls, Little Emily, uh, Florence Dombey, uh, even Nancy, uh, and so on. Um, they were born into the theatre, their parents were actors. Their father died when they were little, so they were working children. Um, they grew up in the theatre, working and working, touring, travelling about, 
sometimes in London in cheap, cheap houses. Um, and they proved, all three proved exceptionally capable and gifted without having any formal education. A hundred years later, they would, of course, have come to Newnham. But at that time, it wasn't possible. They were really, they were really bright. Fanny and Maria wrote books. They acted, they sang professionally, they sang in opera. Uh, uh, they were extremely good linguists. Fanny learned Russian, was able to teach her nephew Russian <coughs> later. They, spoke, they learned Italian, they spoke French. They were bold and enterprising. Fanny became a novelist with Dickens' encouragement. He published some of her novels in his, in his magazine. And uh, Mariah married a brewer, an Oxford brewer, and then became a new woman, left him, came to London, studied at the Slade, took herself to Italy, became a foreign correspondent, travelled alone in northern Africa. <laughs> and she was absolutely amazing, wrote an account of her travels. Now, the least enterprising, you could say, was Nellie, the youngest, because her life was taken over by Dickens, who fell in love with her, who wished to protect her, who wished to be her man. She showed her force of character, I realised, most after Dickens's death. Dickens had taught her several things. One was how to deceive people. Uh, Dickens was very good at deception. He, had, he was a very good actor, and he had to practice deception when he was hiding Nellie from the eyes of the world. So after he died, um, she put what she'd learned to use and remade her life like a phoenix. Well, I wrote a book about this. It was called The Invisible Woman. And in a way, those Turner girls were my favorite sort of subject. They were minor characters. They were almost unknown characters. And they, the characters who changed our view of the past, because they certainly changed my view of uh, 19th century women's lives and of the theatre and how it was a sort of separate world. Um, there would have been no book without Dickens, of course. I mean, my publishers already said, when I said I wanted to write about Turner, they said, why don't you write about Dickens? Um, <laughs> And I said, well, because this is much more interesting, unwisely, I said, in view of what I'm doing now, mm. 20 years later, which is actually... <laughs> in that book, I covered only 13 years of Dickens' life, and I came to feel it had left me with a lot of unfinished business, because although Dickens behaved in some ways, um, in ways that one could disapprove of strongly, Dickens is such an absorbing and exciting character that you always want to know more about him. So I've been working on another story about Dickens, this time covering the whole of his life, 1812 to 1870. His formation, his works, his letters, all 12 volumes are now published and are sitting on my shelves, much, much annotated, as you can imagine. And I'm doing my best to see the whole picture where before I saw only his declining years. You can't sum up a life any more than you can sum up a novel, though. Its value is in the detail. So here are some fragments of another story in which Dickens appears as the central figure. Like the Turn and Sisters, most of you will know a good deal of this, but perhaps not all of it, he came from nowhere, from poverty, from distress, with hardly any formal education. His family was not only poor but dishonest on both sides. His mother's father embezzled Navy office funds for years and had to flee the country to escape prosecution. His father reneged on promissory notes, landing his own brothers-in-law in trouble and having to pay his debts. And in the end, he also was imprisoned. As a child, Dickens knew the pawn shop, the prison, the cheapest lodgings, the life of the labouring child, the roughest London streets. At the same time, his father and mother's families had pretensions to something better. They valued music. They read books. His father liked to think of himself as a gentleman, Although he was the son of servants, he somehow associated himself with his parents' employers, I think, rather than with his parents. He had his own wine dealer, failed to pay the bills, of course. <laughs> he bought books he couldn't afford to buy. He sent his eldest daughter to the Royal College of Music and couldn't pay the bills there, so she had to work her way, teach, to get her teaching. Charles, the eldest son, without help or encouragement, extricated himself from this environment determined to make something of himself and did so as speedily as he could. He was an office boy at 15. With phenomenal energy and determination, he became a parliamentary reporter, forming a lifelong hatred of parliament, <laughs> a newspaper reporter, keeping a lifelong affection for newspapers and journalists. He trained himself as an actor with a serious intention of going into the theatre 
and he kept, of course, a lifelong consuming love of the theatre. He sorted out his domestic life with an early marriage to the docile daughter of Scottish parents, the Hogarths. Father had had a distant connection with Walter Scott and had become a journalist, and Catherine Hogarth was quiet and obedient and fairly pretty and quite dull. <laughs> he almost stumbled into writing fiction. His first book, Sketches by Boz, Collections of pieces he was writing through the early 30s, describing London life, the streets, the people, the amusements, was a success. And from these early observations in that wonderful book, which I would recommend to you all, he built up a store of knowledge that would nourish his art for the rest of his life. I'll give you some examples of what he does in it. He describes, for instance, how the men of North London walked to work six days a week in their thousands setting off early from the suburbs of Somers Town and Camden Town, Islington and Pentonville, where the bakers opened an hour earlier than those in town, so that the vast population of clerks pouring into the city, Chancery Lane, Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, all the other inns of courts, could get their morning rolls at the beginning of their walk. It's wonderful. He's wonderful at observing these things. He noticed the middle-aged men, whose salaries have by no means increased in the same proportion as their families, plodding steadily along, know, knowing almost all the other men by sight after 20 years walking, but not wasting their energy in stopping to shake hands or speak. Later, in A Christmas Carol, Dickens would make Bob Cratchit walk and sometimes run the three miles from Camden Town to the city every day to earn his 15 shillings a week, not much more than Dickens was paid for in his first job as an office boy. He saw the small office lads who were made men before their boys, and alongside them, he saw the girls, milliners, staymakers, apprentices, the hardest worked, the worst paid, and too often the worst used in the community. Another picture, two sisters coming out of a prisoner's van, handcuffed together, 13 and 16, the young were hiding her face and crying into her handkerchief. A woman in the crowd was as gathered shouts, how long are you for, Emily? The elder girl shouts back, six weeks and hard labour, and here's Bella going in for the first time too. Hold up your head, you chicken, hold up your head, and show him your face. <coughs> I ain't jealous, but I'm blessed if I ain't game. <laughs> Dickens thinks the girls have been put to work as prostitutes by a vicious mother, and sympathises with little Bella's shame and horror. But he also enjoys Emily's bold defiance and her readiness to play to the crowd. In this, she is just like the 13-year-old boy in court who defies the judge telling him he has witnesses to his character. Fifteen gentlemen is vatten outside and was a vatten all day yesterday, which they told me the night before my trial was a coming on. No witnesses are found, and the boy will be recreated as the artful dodger, mm -hmm. whose act of defiance in the dock, from which he threatens to have his friends ask questions in Parliament about his case, <laughs> is one of the high points of Oliver Twist, where Dickens invites his readers to approve of such wit and total lack of contrition. Here is a pale, bony little girl with a necklace of blue glass beads being trained up by her mother for the stage in a small private theatre off the Strand where one of Dickens' colleagues made an appearance or two and possibly Dickens himself also. The little girl will dance her first hornpipe on stage after the tragedy. You can imagine how that would have gone down. <laughs> she is a forerunner of the gin-fed infant phenomenon in Nicholas Nickleby. She he then takes us inside a smart new gin shop, all plate glass, turkey carpets, royal arms, stucco, mahogany and varnish to please the poor and get their money, where girls of 14 or 15 with matted hair are seen walking about barefoot and in white greatcoats, almost their only covering. And also to the Eagle Pleasure Gardens between Pentonville and the city, where courting couples go on summer Sundays to enjoy tea and a concert at the Rotunda. Jemima Evans of Camden Town is there, wearing a white muslin gown, carefully hooked and eyed, a little red shawl, plentifully pinned, a large white straw bonnet trimmed with red ribbons, a small necklace, a large pair of bracelets, Denmark satin shoes and open-worked stockings, white cotton gloves on her fingers and a cambric pocket handkerchief carefully folded up in her hand. She is so closely observed she could be painted and we can hear her voice too. She pronounces Evans, Evans, finds the gardens heavenly and calls for an officer when there is a brawl. 